A little bit of test review. This is what we've covered so far this semester. Um, it's been five weeks. It doesn't seem like that much once you put it up on the board. Um, but, but, oh, there's one other thing. Yeah, so it doesn't seem like that much, but um, we've we've done a lot in the context of doing all of this. Um, so, do you have any questions on these things? Does anything does this seem out of whack to you? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm working on your homework. I hopefully have it done for you sometime later on today. I'm about halfway through them, I guess. Um, I posted a, a key to the second homework yesterday or the day before on the Moodle site. So it's it's on there so you can look at, at how I did them. Um, but yeah, my goal is to get those things back to you. Um, I can comment at this point some of the common mistakes that I'm seeing as I'm going through them, which I'll go through when I get to the, the later parts. But yeah, sure. Yeah. Like the format of the test for the Were there multiple choice or? No, multiple, no multiple choice. It's just I'm going to ask you questions. You're going to give me answers. There are going to be some small data sets that you'll be asked to calculate. So expect to see a small chi-square test of homogeneity, a small chi-square test of goodness of fit, a small chi-square test of uh, independence. They won't be as big as the chi-square test of independence that was on your homework. But if you could make it through the one that was in her, your homework, you should be able to make it through this small example that I'll have on the exam. Yeah. So obviously, like, 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 yep, I'll put those on the test. So at the end of the test, there will be a couple of pages, uh, pages of tables, which gets to this part here. So you'll do the you'll do the calculations, but then you'll have to look up in the table what the what the relevant critical value is and and know what to do with that. So yeah, bring your calculators. Um, my advice, take it in pencil. Don't get cocky on me too early in the semester. Um, be prepared to ask questions throughout the test. If you have a question about how I've worded something or what I'm trying to get at or something like that, uh, feel free to do that. I'll, I'll answer as many questions as I can without actually giving you the answer. Um, anything up there look new or surprising to you. Yeah. When is it? Oh, it's Wednesday. Okay. I, I said that last week and the week before, but yeah, it's the day after tomorrow. Yep. Which is why I'm doing this today. <laughs> That's a good question, if you didn't know. Any other questions about what's up there? Yeah. Yes, all by hand. Well, by calculator. So bring a calculator. Yeah. No, I don't want you plugging things into Excel. Once again, all the things I'm going to give you are really small data sets. So one of the things I have to do when I design the test is I have to contemplate, OK, how much time is it going to take to work through these things? And that kind of puts a limit on how big I make things. So all this stuff is going to be small stuff just to test to see that you can do it. Yeah. No, just your calculator. Once again, to Rachel's question, everything's going to be small. You should be able to do it by hand. I have to make the test a test that you can reasonably take in a 65 minute period. So that is always in the back of my mind. This is the only test in the class, so you won't ever have to perform on a test again. Everything else is going to be about what you know how to do, but it's going to be what you know how to do in terms of, of evaluating real-world data sets. So 
This is basically to make sure that you are firm on the fundamentals because remember that there are certain fundamentals that are important. The sums of squares, the, the numerator of the variance estimate is crucially important for virtually every other statistic we're going to calculate in this class. And so having that concept and knowing what I mean when I say the sums of squares is, is an important thing for you to just have locked up in your brain, not something that you need to go and look up in a book. So I want to test you on that on a test because that's a crucially important thing. The chi-square statistic, remember, is very simple and easy. It's the same. You calculate the chi-square statistic the same every time you calculate a chi-square. What makes the difference between a chi-square test of homogeneity and one of independence and one of goodness and fit is how you go about calculating the expected values. So you should know that, that the chi-square statistic itself is this equation, observed minus expected squared divided by expected, summed up over all the categories that you have, but the trick to knowing which, which test is which is how you go about uh, arriving at the expected values. A, a realization that many of my friends in graduate school still had not yet grasped the importance of. Other questions? All right, to the point of the homework. So I, I spent some time over the weekend grading. I'm still in the process of going through that. But let me throw a couple of things up on the on the screens here. So one of the things that I noticed in the homework that I've been grading is that um, you guys are struggling sometimes to arrive at what the correct T statistic is. So just to remind you, in a T table, you're generally calculating 95% confidence intervals. So you want to have an alpha level that is 0 0.05. Now, sometimes T tables are confusing because they give you two alpha levels up here. Remember that these two alpha levels are about whether you have one tail test or two tail tests, whether you're trying to, to test whether two means are different from one another versus mean one is higher than mean two or mean one is lower than mean two. So when you have a distribution of sample means, and you're trying to figure out a 95% confidence interval around the sample mean, you can either put the 5% that you have of type 1 error into the two tails. 
so that there's 95% in the middle, or you could also put the 5% into a single tail, which would bring the T value down in value somewhat. And so when we're constructing a confidence interval though, we generally just want to know what the central portion of the distribution is. So those are always two-tailed confidence intervals. And so what you want to do is you want to look at these. You see that there's a 0.05 here and a 0.05 here. But down here at the bottom, there's a 90% confidence interval and a 95% confidence interval. You want to be in the 95% confidence interval column. This 0.5 up here refers to a two-tailed test if you are looking at a 90% confidence interval. A one-tailed test of 95, oh, sorry. Let's see, how is this doing this? Oh yeah, the, this is when you, yeah, this table is weird the way it's doing it. This is basically putting 5% out into one, one of the two tails versus putting 5% divided into both tails, which would be 0.25. So this is the, the column that you want to be reading at. One of the ways of figuring this out in a t-table is that the correct column that you're looking at, at infinity, is 1.96. That comes from the empirical rule because approximately two standard deviations of the distribution of sample means includes 95% of the of the sample means. The reason in textbooks it's, it said approximately two is because it's actually 1.96. So make sure that you're in the right column. One of the things that I see, that I've seen so far in the homeworks that I've been grading is when you go and look up the t-test, the t-statistic, you should be, for example, at 2.262 and you put down 1.833. So make sure that you're in the correct column. This applies to t-statistics, and it also applies to the chi-square test. Make sure that you're in the correct, the correct alpha level for your, your problem. Another thing that I'm seeing are minor issues with whether to use the sample size versus the sample size minus one in your calculations. Once again, these are, these are small, niggling, little, little mistakes, but what they end up doing is they end up changing things like the confidence intervals kind of drastically. So did you guys have all this? All right. So who can tell me how to calculate the mean, the sample mean? Okay, that was Elizabeth's verbal description. Everybody agree with that? Yeah. So what this is, add up all the data. Adding up all the data is what that means mathematically. Dividing by how many data you have is that. So a verbal description that we can put into an equation. Uh, what's the method for sample variance? How do we calculate sample variance? Verbal description. Is that all we do with the data points minus the mean? We have to square those. And then you add them all up and you divide by Sample size minus one. The sum 
across all of the data of each data value minus the mean squared divided by n minus 1, right? Verbal description, the equation. Standard deviation. Yep, it's just the square root of the sample variance. In this case, the verbal description is also the equation. Um, standard error of the mean. It's the standard deviation. Divided by the square root of n. Yep, so it's just s divided by the square root of n. Not the square root of n minus 1, some of you. Okay? Uh, how do we get the confidence interval? Well, the first thing that we need to know is the correct t statistic, right? So somebody tell me what the t statistic is for an alpha level of 0.05 and a sample size of 8. What's that? Why is that not correct? Who said 2.306? Why is that not correct? I'm going to let you fix yourself this time. Sample size is 8, so the degrees of freedom is 7. So what would it be? 2.365. Do you have a question? OK. I let her fix herself. I figured she could, so. Um, what's the T statistic for this? Two point two two eight. Why is it two point two two eight rather than? 2.262. This is the degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom is n minus 1. So what's the sample size of this problem? You have a sample size of 11. Good. All right. So what did you say it was? 2.228. So if we have a sample size of 11, how would we go about calculating the confidence interval? Confidence interval has an upper limit and a lower limit, right? What's the upper limit for a confidence interval of a, of a mean? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, sure. How, how would you calculate it? Not 1.96, because this is a sample size of 11. 1.96 would be if you had an infinitely large sample size. So this is a sample size of 11, which is 10 degrees of freedom. So it's the mean plus 2.228 times what? The standard error. And what would the lower limit be? Yep. OK. So your sample size determines what your t statistic is. That determines how wide the confidence interval has to be. The t statistic gets bigger the smaller your sample size is, because with small samples, you have less and less confidence of where that mean actually should be. And so that should make, hopefully, intuitive sense. If you have a small sample size, n equals 8, 
is 2.365. You have a slightly larger sample size, n of 11. It goes down a little bit, okay? Questions on, on this? The other thing that I'm finding you're struggling with doing is interpreting a result. So you do the calculations, and you work through the calculations just fine, and you get to the end and you find a chi-square statistic that you calculate. And so, That wasn't what I wanted to pull up. So you do this jazz with these candidates, and what you find is you find that you have a chi-square value calculated of... Um, 39.72, and you find that the cal, the, the chi-square uh, that is the critical value from the table is 9.488. And then at the end of each of these questions, I asked you to interpret what that means. And some of you just didn't do it at all, which is disappointing, because it's the last thing that's on the, on the question. But some of you attempted and you didn't do a very good job of it. So... Somebody for this data set from the homework, interpret for me what this means. You find this statistical result. What does it mean, not in terms of the null hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis, but what does it mean in terms of the actual data? There's definitely a preference. If you had to narrow down what that preference would be, what would it be? Yeah, Trump and Cruz are more preferred, Bush and other are less preferred, and Carson is kind of there, fairly neutral, right? And so you could interpret this as That's true, but you know what that is not? It's not helpful. It's not informative. If you're an actual pollster who knows how to do a public opinion survey but doesn't know how to analyze it, remember these are data presumably gathered by a student at William Jewell College, that answer for them doesn't help them one iota. But what's the null hypothesis here? The null hypothesis was a, was a hypothesis of what? No preference. So if you reject the null hypothesis, what are you saying? There is a preference, exactly what you said. Yep. So We could go and look up whatever the p-value is. Whenever you make a conclusion, you basically say what the result means in terms of the data. And then if you need to throw in the statistical support that says what I just told you is actually true, then do that. But whenever I ask you for an interpretation of the result, I'm looking for something that is phrased in the context of the actual data. Because that's ultimately what people are wanting to know about, right? They don't really care. As a matter of fact, this student who did this, this particular poll might not even know what the null hypothesis is. So telling them that it's a rejection of the null hypothesis doesn't really help them at all. They might have recognized that they were doing a preference survey, but they might have just thought it's a public opinion survey, but I don't really know 
how to analyze it. So I'm not actually thinking that I'm actually looking for people's preferences or not, preferences and avoidances. So putting, putting the explanation in the context of the data is much better than, than that. And this is true for anything, whether you're talking about a preference, whether you're talking about whether one distribution differs from another distribution, whether you're talking about whether or not two means are different, what are the two means that are different or not? That's what you're ultimately testing. Um, those are the three things, I guess. Oh, the other thing that I think you're struggling with, not based on the homeworks, because a lot of people came and asked me about this, and then I helped them work through their homework. And so they got it correct on the homework, but I just want to make sure that you, that you know how to do this is a number of you have struggled with knowing when to use what type of chi-square analysis and what the calculations are and how they differ depending on the type of chi-square analysis that you're working on. So um, what questions can I answer for you about that? Yeah. Okay, for homogeneity, because it's just a preference, this is, this is the example. This is a chi-square test of homogeneity. Your, your null hypothesis, your, your, the thing that you're trying to reject in this case, is, is there no preference? Well, if there's no preference, then everybody would have the same number of, of respondents to the poll. So all you need to know, really, for the expected values is how many people responded, in this case, to the poll, how many observations do you have, and then you just divide them evil, evenly by the number of categories that you have. So 17.6 is just 88 divided by 5. What am I doing? So it's just the total number of observations that you have divided by the number of categories. And then everything's even. So remember, homogeneity. Do you guys ever buy milk? You guys all buy milk? Do you get homogenized milk? You get homogenized milk because that's the only kind of milk that you can buy in the grocery store. Do you know what the homogenization process is for milk? No? Basically, they jiggle it up under a little bit of heat over and over again because milk has two components. It has a cream portion, which is fat, and it has an aqueous portion. And the cream, you can actually let milk settle out over time, and the cream separates. And at a milk, at a, at a dairy, what they do is they let it separate and then they scoop the cream off the top and then they add back that fat content to make, you know, 1%, 2% whole milk, etc. But with whole milk, if you let whole milk just sit in your refrigerator for a long enough period of time, two things happen. One thing that happens is it goes bad. But before it goes bad, you'll start to see the cream separate from the aqueous portion of the milk. And so the part of homogenizing, the reason that we homogenize our milk is because it's actually better done by a machine. And also people don't want to buy milk that's separated. It just looks weird. It doesn't look like milk. And so the homogenizing process makes milk look the same from top to bottom. So when you think about a chi-square test of homogeneity, the reason it's called homogeneity is that you're assuming that the expected values are homogeneous. They're the same from top to bottom. So think of a uh, chi-square test of homogeneity, kind of like a gallon of milk that you get from the grocery store. The top of that looks exactly like the bottom, like the bottom part, and that looks exactly like the middle. It's homogeneous. These expected frequencies are homogeneous. Okay, does that help at all? Okay. Yeah. So it was the fourth question that Question. Oh, yeah. Okay, so in the truck question, what we're given is you might think that, that you're actually given two things, and so you might think that this is an independent question, but the two things that you're given, though, are actually not in the same units because this is a proportion of traffic, it sums to one.
This is an actual number of trucks that sums to 414. Whenever you see something like this where you're given two variables, but they're both in different units, um, that should signal to you that this isn't a chi-square test of independence. This is some other kind of chi-square test. In this case, what they're doing is they're giving you an external distribution that they're asking you to compare to an observed distribution. So they went and they just went out and, and measured the number of trucks on the highway. That tells you what truck traffic is. Then they went and sampled, well, how many of these trucks were actually overweight? And what they're wanting to know is, does this proportion of the total trucks that were overweight, is that proportional just to regular truck traffic? Or is this somehow higher or lower than what you would expect on the basis of normal truck traffic? When you're comparing an observed, observ uh, an observed set of observations to some theoretical distribution, what type of chi-square test is that? Pardon? It's a chi-square goodness of fit test. You're trying to see how well do these observed data fit this distribution. But of course, the problem with that is that the, the proportions are not in the same units as the number of trucks. This is an account of the number of trucks. This is a proportion of trucks. So how do we get the expected values in this case? Yep, yeah, so you take the proportion for Monday's traffic and you ask yourself, well, if I was looking for the total number of, if I'm looking for the total number of overweight trucks that would occur on a Monday if overweight trucks were proportional to just the normal traffic, it would be 0.191 times 414. That gives you 79.074, which is somewhat below 90, which is why that contributes quite a lot to the chi-square, but it's not, it's not radically out, out there. Um, and you do the same thing for each of these. Remember that your expected frequencies and your observed frequencies should always sum to the same number. And this is how you get that in this case, by multiplying this proportion times the total number to get what you would expect on a Monday, what you would expect on a Tuesday, what you would expect on a Wednesday, what you would expect on a Thursday. So you use that hypothetical distribution to calcul ex calculate your expected frequencies. Does that help? Now these questions mean more to you because you've actually done the homework. Hopefully they mean more to you. Yes? So I did the opposite way, I think. I did the I did expected proportions based on numbers. Uh, uh, oh yeah, no, because what you're wanting to know is so does that mean that you compared a proportion to a proportion? Ah, yeah. So what that does is that actually reduces the size of the differences. So it would be very difficult to see a result if a result was there because you're, so if, what's, what's 90 divided by 14? Somebody real quick do that for me. 90 divided by 414. It's actually a common mistake that I see all people in graduate school making all the time, actually. What's it? So this is the frequency. This is the observed frequency. The expect, oh, sorry. The expected frequency was 0 0.191. That difference is really tiny. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you, what you've done is you've rescaled what was 90 trucks down to this little tiny number. And so when you calculate the chi-square, it's going to be a really tiny number, even if your differences are actually quite large. And so by doing that, you, you basically are reducing your chances of finding a difference if a difference actually, if a difference actually exists. So what you want to do is you want to retain the actual units that your data are in. And so you would take this, multiply that. So you have 90 and 79 to compare to one another. 
And that's the real difference in the number of trucks. The number of trucks that you observe versus the number of trucks that you expect, not the proportion of trucks that you observe compared to the proportion of trucks that you expect. You're not the first person to make that mistake. I can show you journal articles of papers that have been published that made that mistake. Don't ask me how they got past the reviewers. I don't know. This is why you're taking this class, so you actually know something about statistics. Other questions about chi-squares? T-tests, the T-statistic, gets smaller as you go up in sample size. What happens to the chi-square critical value as you go up in sample size? It gets bigger. Why? Yeah, you're adding up more columns, so those should add to larger, larger and larger values the more, the more categories that you have. So once again, when we have a chi-square statistic, Why do I not have a chi-square table? Anyway, once again, you want to be in the in the correct column, and you should expect the numbers to go up the bigger the sample size that you have. Remember that in most cases, the degrees of freedom is the sample size minus 1. In a t-test, this is actually the sample size. In a chi-square test, this is the number of categories that you have. But this is different in a chi-square test of independence, right? How do you calculate the chi-square test of independence degrees of freedom? So think of the rows as one type of sample and the columns as another type of sample. The degrees of freedom is derived from one minus each of those, and then you multiply those things together. So if you have three columns by five rows, that would be two times four, eight, et cetera. What did you find to be the most difficult question on the homework? The fourth one, which is, oh, really? The trucks was the most difficult one. Really? You guys didn't find this one difficult? Okay, it's tedious, all right. So when you got to the end, you found a chi-square calculated of like 196.7 or something, right? Right? And that was compared to a chi-square value in the table of 26 something. 20. It was down in the 20s. I don't remember exactly what it was. What does that mean in terms of interpreting these data? They're not independent. What does that mean? So in, express that in terms of the actual data themselves. Denominations are related to birth control methods used in what way? Somebody help Elizabeth out if she wants it. Do you want help? Somebody help Elizabeth out. Yeah. Or avoid different types of birth control methods. Sure, that, that's a better way of stating that. You're saying that they're independent, but you're actually relating that statement of, of lack of independence through the data themselves. Some denominations or non-denominations, non-believers, for example, use birth control at 
either rates higher or rates lower than you would expect. And so how do you know what's going on in this table? So they're, they're, they're not independent. The denomination that you happen to be affects the type of birth control that you use. But what does that really mean? How do we know that people preferred Trump and Cruz over Bush and other? Yeah, we looked at each category's contribution to why this chi-square statistic is so big. This chi-square statistic is big because we have big contributions here. We have big contributions here. Carson doesn't really contribute anything to this chi-square test. So these guys are big and these guys are big, but these guys are big because people prefer them. These guys contribute a lot because people are actively avoiding them. Okay, so when we go back to the birth control data, we have these observations, but how do you know what the nature of this lack of independence is? Well, we can go to the actual contributions to the chi-square statistic, and we can see that some of these categories contribute a lot. 69.25, that's contributing a ton to this highly significant chi-square test. Well, that's, uh, that's others using condoms. So that contributes a lot. Do you know if that's a preference for condoms? They use condoms more than you would expect, or is it they use condoms less than you would expect? How can you tell? You could go and look at the values. You could go look at the expected values. The expected value is 113, and the observed value is 202. So in this case, people who are of something other than Christian, do they prefer condoms, or are they avoiding condoms? Yeah, they're they have a preferential use of condoms. They're using condoms more than you would expect. So this is the nature of it. So you could look at each of these things that I've highlighted in red. These are the observations. You could compare them to the expectations and you could say, well, these are the things that are contributing to the overall chi-square. In some cases, individuals are preferring one use over another, and in some cases, they're actively avoiding other uses, probably because they're preferring some use of, of some other method. Um, so always thinking about the, the conclusion in the framework of the data themselves is more useful to the receiver of the data. And in this case, who's receiving the data on the exam? No, you're not. You're analyzing the data and you're giving it to someone. Who are you giving it to? You're giving it to me. I want to receive that data in its most useful form. So explain to me what the analysis means in terms of the data themselves. Questions? Yes. Uh huh. So this would just be a chi-square 
0 0.05 for the alpha level and 6 degrees of freedom. So I don't know why I don't have a chi-square table in my PowerPoint. But this is it. Well, what did I do? Oh, it's auto scaling. So I would go to the 0.05 level here, and uh, six degrees of freedom is 12.592. Right there is where I would get it. So I'll have a chi square table on the test for you. I'll also have a t table on the test for you. The other way you could go and do this, if you don't trust this chi-square table, because God knows where that chi-square table came from, you could also go to Daniel Soper's website, go to the chi-square section, critical chi-square value calculator, and it's going to ask you for how many degrees of freedom you have, you want six degrees of freedom because there's seven days of the week, and you can calculate what that is, 12.59. So same same answer. Oh, so this. So this is just the same way that you would always, that you would do this. So um, we talked about how you get the expected value. The expected value is the, the hypothetical proportion times the total number of trucks, which gave you an expected value of 72 point, no, 79 point. You had an observed number of trucks of 90 trucks. And so the chi-square is just the observed minus the expected squared divided by the expected. And that for this thing is 1.5. Then for this, for the next one, 0.198 times 414. Is 81.97. Which is very close to 82. So you should expect this value to be really small. And it ends up being, so it's just the observed minus expected divided by the expected. Observed minus expected divided by the expected. That's. 9 times 10 to the 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 10 to the minus 6. So that's a really tiny number, which is to be expected. It's not contributing much to the chi-square statistic because the observed value is not very far from the expected value at all. It's damn close to the expected. And so you would expect that contribution to the overall chi-square to be really small. The next one was 0 0.187 times 414, which is 77.418. Once again, that's very close to what you observed. So observe minus expected squared divided by expected should once again contribute relatively little. And it does. It's just 0.379. Okay. So these are each of the individual contributions, and then you add those up across all the categories, and that gives you your ultimate chi-square statistic. So this is what I mean when I say the chi-square value that you calculate is simply the observed minus the expected squared divided by the expected summed. Why can I not make sigmas? summed across all of the categories that you have, this is the same way you calculate it for homogeneity, same way you calculate it for goodness fit, same way you calculate it for an independence test. The question is, how do you arrive at what the expected value is? In this case, because it's a goodness of fit test, you get that expected value from some external distribution.
a homogeneity test, you get it by dividing the total number of observations by the number of categories, so everything's the same. In a independence test, the data themselves dictate what the expected value should be through the row columns, row totals and column totals. Okay? So it's all about how you calculate expected. And that's where people screw up chi-square tests mostly, is they have <coughs> a chi-square <coughs> test of goodness of fit, and they don't calculate their expected frequencies correctly. But then once you have the expected frequencies, it's just that equation, always that equation. No, because that's an equation that you've now used enough, you should just know that off the top of your head. In the same way that I'm not going to provide you equations for means, variances, standard deviations, et cetera, et cetera, because I want you to I want you to know how to do it way more than I want you to know the equation. And I've been clear about that from the beginning of class. I think I told you guys, I know the equation because I know how to do it. I don't know how to do it because I know the equation. Questions? So you guys ready to start two sample tests? No, we have like 10 minutes left. Let's load something up on you in the last 10 minutes and really scramble your brains before the exam. Other questions? Those things that I wrote on the board at the beginning of the class for memory of what we've done so far in this class, those are the things that are bopping around in my mind as I make the test out over the next 24 hours. And those are the things that we've spent time on for the last five weeks. This marks the, just got an email this morning from the provost. This is the end of the first five weeks of classes. So we've been doing these things for five weeks. Taking some time out to do stuff on R. I'm not going to ask you anything on R. I could ask you what the assignment operator is, but I'm not. You'll learn what the assignment operator is eventually. All right, then as far as I'm concerned, we're done. If you have any questions, email me or come by my office. I'll send you an email when I'm done with the, the homework and you can come by and pick it up.